Hi, we're going to talk about Otto Warburg, uh, MD, PhD, nutrition hero. He was a great cancer researcher. He lived from 1883 to 1970s, considered the greatest biochemist from about 1920 to 1950 in the world. Um, his father was a physicist, so he was introduced to physics at a young age. His mentor, Emil Fischer, was a great organic chemist, and he's the one who designed the Fischer projection you know, for drawing chemical structures. I remember Fischer like a fishing rod, a straight uh, line, um, non-ring form. Uh, Otto Warburg uh, was also very interested in cell biology. He finally won a Nobel Prize in 1931, and he felt that he deserved to win three of them. Um, also, he had an incredibly wonderful research setup whereby he was given a laboratory with excellent equipment and told, do whatever you want. We know you're a great scientist. So that's, you know, that's a perfect situation. Most modern scientists are so busy begging for a grant, they don't have as much time to do research as they would like. Uh, three of his students won Nobel Prizes, uh, Theorel. Uh, Meyerhoff was uh, the Ebden Meyerhoff pathway glycolysis. Okay, talk about involvement in metabolism. Uh, Warburg himself did the key research on mitochondria. Uh, Hans Krebs was a student who discovered the Krebs cycle, which is also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And by the way, this is going to be super useful, this lecture, for everybody. I got to go through a little bit of this introductory stuff to set the stage, if you will, but trust me, Varberg is somebody you want to know about. He, he did something, something incredible that's going to be useful to you. Um, and what I'm basically saying is just this guy's laboratory was the foundational site for understanding metabolism. Ebden Meyerhoff pathway was his student. Krebs cycle was his student. And he himself figured out key things about the mitochondria. He also trained Walter Kempner, who went on to... Um, Duke University and developed the rice diet and was one of the greatest nutritional doctors who ever lived. So Varberg's most famous research was on respiration. And we now call respiration electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. Basically, it's how the mitochondria make ATP. The mitochondria is the ATP factory of the cell. And Varberg was obsessed with very precise measurements and he was very careful. But he developed a lot of the equipment that's used to measure uh, the amount of oxygen uptake, for example, in a cell. And his experiments were always repeatable. So this is well known, this research of Varberg. And uh, Pritikin writes about it. Anybody who's interested in cancer writes about it and knows about this. But this is sort of an advanced thing. Average person with only a superficial understanding of cancer won't know about this. But if you want to understand cancer better, you need to know this. Okay? He worked with tissue cultures, and he would vary the amount of oxygen available to them. And what he found out was when he took the tissue culture and he deprived them of oxygen, of variable percentages, he could induce them to become cancer. And he noticed that under hypoxic conditions with a lack of oxygen, many of the cells would die, but some of them would not die. They would undergo what he believed was an irreversible transformation and become able to metabolize based primarily on glycolysis anaerobic. Okay, And they would continue to run on glycolysis even when oxygen was restored to the cell. So he basically was transforming them into anaerobes, meaning transforming them into cells that run without oxygen, sort of like primitive cells. And that's why you'll hear cancer cells de-differentiated. And the more a cancer cell is de-differentiated, like on the biopsy results, as far as biopsies are concerned, by the way, cytology is a small needle. Individual cells, you look at them under a microscope, okay? Histology is when you've got a big chunk of cells and you can see the relationship to each other. It's like the architecture of the cells um, on a biopsy specimen. Okay, the end product of glycolysis, which is metabolism of glucose without oxygen, is to produce um, lactic acid. And that's what cancer cells do. They produce a lot of lactic acid. But if you have oxygen present, typically the end product of glycolysis is to make acetyl-CoA and the acetyl group, two carbon group, is sent into Krebs cycle, which subsequently its electron carriers go on to the mitochondria for electron transport, and that's coupled to oxidative phosphorylation. But the cancer cells make lactic acid, and they eventually push that into their extracellular matrix, create an acidotic milieu around the cancer cell. And this acidotic hypoxic milieu favors the cancer cell over the surrounding adjacent cells. And this tendency of cancer cells to run on glycolysis even if oxygen is present. So run anaerobic glycolysis is called the Warburg effect. Okay, I'm kind of pronouncing the W like a V. It's often the way to do it. Okay. 
Now, here's an example of a red blood cell. This is going to be highly relevant. This is going to be relevant for tons of diseases. This is really good to know. Red blood cell is typically about 7 microns. Capillary is typically about 5 microns, a little smaller than a red blood cell. So what that means is the red blood cell, so here, let me get a, a marker. Okay, imagine this is a red blood cell. It has to go through the capillary. All right. Well, I got to turn it sideways so it's bigger than the capillary. So normally it would have to deform to fit through that capillary. And under normal conditions, it's pretty flexible. Uh, red blood cell is like a bag of blood. It's got a really flexible membrane, typically under normal conditions. Um, so it can deform readily to pass through there. But when there's a lot of fat in the blood, either from the chylomicrons, you know, bulking up the blood, uh, from just plain old increased triglycerides, from uh, LDL cholesterol functioning as a bridging molecule, like this picture here, sticking the uh, red blood cells together, then it becomes very sluggish, very difficult for the red blood cells to pass through the capillaries. Blood pressure has to go up, that injures endothelium, initiates a cascade of events leading to worsening atherosclerosis. But the bottom line is oxygen delivery is dropped. With the PO2 drop, let's say about 15 to 20, and you're going to get less oxygen to your tissues. You'd say, well, you know, that's not that big of a drop in oxygen. Well, people will superimpose multiple things on top of that. Smoke a cigarette, patient has sleep apnea, they're diabetic. Um, uh, these things will add up to worsen the ability of oxygen delivery to that tissue. And now, like in Warburg's experimental setting, the tissue is being made hypoxic. You don't want your tissue to be hypoxic, deprived of oxygen. Okay, so more on Varber's work. You know, long before the dinosaurs walked the earth, before there were even animals at all, the world was dominated. Before there was oxygen on earth that was readily available, it was dominated by anaerobic bacteria. So in a sense, these cancer cells have de-differentiated back to a primitive concept of a cell, like a bacteria, like an anaerobic bacteria. And their gene expression has to change. One of the fundamental changes is that instead of running their usual hexokinase enzyme, They'll run something called hexokinase type 2, and it's like a vacuum to suck glucose into the cell, and it's stuck tight up to the mitochondria, and it actually binds to an ion channel that protects um, the ion flow of the mitochondria so it doesn't go into apoptosis. Most cells, you deprive them of oxygen, they're dead, okay? But these cells, if the hexokinase 2 becomes readily available fast enough, it can move into anaerobic metabolism and it'll stabilize its mitochondrial membrane so it doesn't go into apoptosis, program cell death. All right, and this is very characteristic of cancer cells. Some claim it happens in every cancer cell. A normal human cell is well differentiated. It's part of a team. Liver cells, they do what liver cells do. They detox the blood. They maintain blood glucose during fasting phase, okay? A kidney cell does what kidney cells do. It filters the blood. Okay, but a cancer cell, it doesn't care about being part of a team. It doesn't care about whatever the rest of the liver or the kidney or the lung or any other organ system does. It just wants to grow and stay alive. Its attitude is pretty much, look, I'm starving for oxygen. I'm just going to run on anaerobic glycolysis. Forget about the rest of you guys. Okay, so a cancer cell, the more dedifferentiated it is, the worse it is in general. And what Varberg showed, he did this with mouse cells in tissue culture, that when they were exposed to hypoxia, he could repeatedly transform them into cancer cells. In the opinion of Dr. Varberg, he felt that this is the fundamental primary cause of cancer. Now, there is much debate about that. This would be Varberg's theory, the Varberg effect, and what is called the metabolic theory of cancer. There are other theories of cancer. The most common one is what is called the somatic mutation theory, or the genetic theory of cancer, with the emphasis that is cancer is thought under this way of thinking to be primarily caused by mutations. And there are things that cause mutations and cause cancer. You know, DNA injury, let's say from skin cancer with a sunburn. Um, there's also other things that can cause cancer. If a person's immunosuppressed, the, immuno, the immune system can't remove the cancer as readily from the body. That happens in transplant patients sometimes because they're immunosuppressed. Um, and they're increased risk for cancer. And there's a spot where there's chronic inflammation. Like let's say there's, they've, they've got asbestos inhaled into their lungs. That will cause a foreign body inflammatory reaction on a chronic basis, which can lead to cancer. We're going to talk about more of that in a little bit. There's some very interesting thoughts on that. Um, and then everybody knows that animal protein increases cancer. But what animal protein does is it's a cancer promoter, meaning that once cancer is present, it encourages it to grow more than it otherwise would. 
So that's a little bit different. Insulin-like growth factor and mTOR are, in a sense, nutrient-sensing pathways. And when lots of animal proteins available, they have a tendency to promote proliferation of cell growth. Okay, so that's a bit of a different topic. That's tumor promoters. Um, and now, what most people don't know is hypoxia can cause cancer. And that's actually the big thing that Varberg figured out. So then the next question becomes, what causes hypoxia? And that's what we just showed those slides for with the Rouleau formation because that is a big cause of tissue hypoxia, a major cause of tissue hypoxia. Dietary fat because of the chylomicrons that thicken the blood, because of the LDL cholesterol bridging molecules that stick together the red blood cells. Um, that will make the blood thicker and decrease oxygen supply to the tissues. In addition, you add some sodium, vasoconstrictor, you take that artery and you clamp it down from the sodium. Sodium is a vasoconstrictor and a lot of people eat way too much sodium. We talked about that. Primitive populations on their old fashioned uh, saltless diets are only eating about 200 milligrams a day. Whereas a lot of modern people, they're eating 10,000 uh, milligrams a day. So they're heavily, severely vasoconstricted. Blood pressure goes up. They're also deficient in potassium and magnesium, the vasodilators that come from plants. So they have trouble vasodilating, hypertension. All right. What Varberg said was that hypoxia is the primary cause of cancer, and he felt that nothing else was necessary. That is the opinion of Varberg, okay? Um, Varberg had said in his article on metabolism of tumors in 1930, all normal mammal cells have an absolute requirement for oxygen, but cancer cells can live without oxygen. This is a rule with no exceptions, okay, in his opinion. All right, Varberg wrote that cancer could be prevented if the respiration of cells could be kept intact, if the mitochondria could be kept intact. To prevent cancer, Varberg recommended keep the speed of the blood high. You want to keep the speed of blood flow high, all right? Remember that. What slows down blood flow? Rouleau formation, chylomicrons, fat, fat. That's why I say fat is bad. It slows down blood flow, it diminishes oxygen supply to the tissues. In my opinion, after much study, I believe you want to minimize dietary fat to the extent that you can. The amount of dietary fat correlates with the amount of cancer. More dietary fat, more cancer. Um, and you want, what Varberg said is you want oxygen still present in that venous blood. And he felt that ideally cells should be saturated with oxygen. And he felt, of course, avoid external carcinogens, things that can damage DNA. And he also felt this could be achieved by anybody. This is not um, some impossible thing you need to spend, you know, tons of money on. Okay, now I'm going to show you something about some famous research experiments. The first one, the black line, is saturated fat. And this comes from the research of Peter Kuo. He was a cardiologist in Philadelphia in the 1950s and 60s. And what he did was he fed the patients a high-fat meal, and then he checked their blood, you know, he drew some blood from their arm every 30 minutes. And he noticed that after a high-fat meal with a lot of saturated fat, you know, animal products, meat, they would, um, cream, they would get peak lipemia at five hours. And then at that same time, these are a bunch of cardiac angina patients, people who get chest pain due to stenosis from atherosclerosis in their coronary arteries. At peak lipemia, which was about five hours, they would have their highest frequency of anginal attacks, most severe anginal attacks, which is a good indicator that's what's causing it because it's making their heart hypoxic, all right? And then there was a big push in the 1960s, you know, Ansel Keys and the seven country study showing the links between saturated fat and elevated cholesterol and coronary artery disease. There was a big push, well, let's avoid saturated fat. Let's use unsaturated fat. Let's use all these different types of oils. So vegetable oils became uh, a lot more popular in the 1960s, and Quo wanted to study that, so he gave people vegetable oils, and what he found was the vegetable oils, he was checking their blood, you know, every 30 minutes. They kept the Rouleau formation for a more prolonged amount of time. They were worse than the sap fat meal. At nine hours, you know, him and his lab team wanted to go home, and they still had high lipemia in the blood. So that was a bit of a surprising finding. So you can't win with sat fat or unsat fat. Okay, continuing with Otto Warburg. Um, other observations were made, like by Nathan Pritikin. He noticed that the Japanese smoked a lot of cigarettes, let's say in the 1950s and 60s, but they didn't have that much lung cancer. An American person who smoked the same amount, same amount would have way more lung cancer, okay? Why would the American person smoking the same amount as a Japanese guy, plus the Japanese guys pounding down all the salt, why would the American get more cancer? And what Pritikin felt, it's because the American guy was also eating a high-fat meal, so he's got high uh, blood cholesterol, meaning more tissue hypoxia. 
Smoking a cigarette is going to give you tissue hypoxia just from the carbon monoxide in the cigarettes. And then you superimpose on that the high cholesterol and the blood with the Rulo, the chylomicrons and all that. And uh, you got relatively ischemic tissue, hypoxic tissue, okay? So that's a very interesting observation. And uh, Pritikin can believe that any patient with cancer should be on a cholesterol-free diet, in his opinion. Tobacco causes hypoxia, like we said, from the carbon monoxide. Simple sugars will increase blood triglycerides, making the blood thicker, decreasing oxygen delivery. Alcohol drinking will also cause fatty liver, increase blood triglycerides, um, and uh, impair oxygen delivery. Diabetes, which is due primarily to dietary fat causing mitochondrial dysfunction in the muscle, leads secondarily to fatty liver, and then it leads to hyperglycemia. The high blood glucose then can get into cells that are not insulin dependent for their uptake of glucose, things like endothelial cells, anywhere in the body. So that's also then going to have the net effect of impairing oxygen delivery to the tissues. Okay, and again, you superimpose on that a cigarette, sleep apnea, or any one of these other problems, you're talking about very hypoxic tissue. Diabetics, fat people, they got a lot more cancer. Okay, how does one keep the blood flowing fast? Avoid dietary fat. Okay, pretty obvious. Avoid sodium. Don't be adding a lot of salty food. Now, it also depends how healthy and how sick you are. You know, you're 20 years old. You're about as healthy as it gets. You can afford to eat a little more salt on your food. But, man, you're pushing 60 and you got some problems, you want to minimize it. You can do whatever you want, but I'm just saying, if you want to lower your risk of cancer, this is a suggestion that seems to help based on the research. Okay, and it totally makes sense. It makes perfect sense. All right. You want to avoid estrogenic chem chemicals, tend to induce obesity, increase insulin resistance over time. Avoid processed food. Avoid leaky gums and gut. Take care of your teeth. Take care of your, uh, and eat your healthy diet with your fiber. Avoid excessive uh, iron because that leads to oxidative stress and some other problems we're not going to get into right now. Um, Varberg himself was very meticulous about avoiding anything he thought was carcinogenic. <laughs> um, now, some people feel that the somatic mutation theory lacks demonstration of a stepwise pattern of mutations. You know, for example, you have a characteristic stepwise pattern of mutations, and let's say in a colon, you know, you'll have display, metaplasia, dysplasia, polyps before you get this full-blown cancer and invasive cancer, and they'll get even a carcinoma in situ. You get that at some other locations, too. There's things related to that for the formation of cancer in the esophagus, in the breast, in the cervix, etc. And they'll say it's like Darwinism lacking transitional forms. But right back at the other side, they'll say, well, hold on a sec. The metabolic theory of cancer can't explain this stepwise pattern that's found either. So there's truth in that. It's not exactly clear why it's like that. Um, pathology textbooks will tell you, oh, it's routine that a rapidly growing cell will function largely on an anaerobic basis because it's, it's shunting uh, gly glucose carbon skeletons to be made into ribose, which is, you know, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It needs those, the ribo as in ribose. And so that's why it's shunting glucose molecule there. So what the pathology textbook will tell you is that any rapidly growing cell is going to run some anaerobic glycolysis and it's going to suck up tons of glucose because it needs those carbon skeletons to make DNA. When a cell divides, it needs twice as much DNA. So the cell that it divides into will have an equal amount of DNA. All right. Uh, why does inflammation cause cancer? Now, this is really clever. Nathan Pritikin. This is from Nathan Pritikin's review of the medical literature published posthumously in 1988. This is available on drmcdougall.com's website. You can read it yourself. It's brilliant. Nathan Pritikin was a genius. Okay. So what Pritikin believes is happening is that, well, let's say you have you inhale asbestos fibers. Your inflammatory uh, immune system will wall them off with some inflammation. Fibroblasts, which are the tissues, the cells that make scar tissue, fibrosis, will then make a wall around it, an avascular fibrotic wall. And Pritikin says he thinks that some cells are trapped inside that avascular fibrotic wall, and most of them die from hypoxia, but some of them can transform themselves into anaerobics and then grow out of control like a cancer cell. And that's what he believes is the mechanism. And you can do that in a mouse. You implant a foreign body, like a plastic disc. It'll form a fibrotic scar around it. And then those mice will have a high incidence of tumors growing out of that region. And, you know, you can transplant that tumor into another mouse and a tumor grows knowing that it's a real tumor, you know, even more than just looking at the, the slide images. Okay, um, so... Normally, the immune system removes cancer cells, but if the immune system is impaired, like from excess uh, dietary fat, from diabetes or uh, immunosuppressants, for whatever the reason, it's less able to move, remove cancer cells. Exercise really helps a lot. And you'll see a lot of people who've done really well in cancer have um, done tons of exercise. Like there's this one lady, Ruth Heidrich, you know, and she was first diagnosed with breast cancer. And they asked her, what is she going to do? She said, I'm going to go run a marathon. And it sounds crazy, but she had an incredibly, she did incredibly well. And I think all that exercise 
really gets the lymphatic fluid flowing, and that helps the immune system to travel through the lymphatics and helps it to remove cancer. It sort of strengthens the cancer. And she also ate largely raw vegan for what that's worth. Um, she believes that that helped her immune system function. Okay, so <coughs> I just wanted to show you a little bit about food here as it relates to our discussion of reducing dietary fat. Some people say, well, why do I think potato is so great and rice is so great? Look at the amount of fat in a potato, 1%. White rice, 1%. Oh, and I forgot to draw a line on that one graph from a couple pages ago. You saw, you saw the saturated fat, peak lipemia. You saw the unsaturated fat, peak lipemia. The same graph, they took no, no fat in the diet or like, like low amounts like this. You don't get any of that peak lipemia. You don't get Rouleau. So you better oxygenate your tissues, okay? Um, potatoes, 1% or less of fat. White rice, 1% or less of fat. These are incredible foods. Billions of people eat these foods and they're skinny and they're healthy with hardly any cancer, okay? Um, I also showed some fruits in here, very low amounts of, uh, of fat. And now look at the meats, okay? They're off the charts. You know, hamburger, 45% fat. Pork, 75% fat. Even the leanest chicken, like 25% fat. Salmon, 50% fat. That's going to thicken your blood, decrease oxygen to your tissues. You don't want that, especially if you're worried about cancer. Um, and nuts, you know, there's all these people who love nuts, and, you know, all this talk about nuts. Look at these nuts. A lot of these nuts, 70 to 90% fat. And now, I realize there's some things about nuts, you know, it's there's some differences, okay? It's a raw food, it's a plant food, but it's still, that's a lot of fat. And uh, increased dietary fat increases the risk of uh, sludging the blood, reload formation, and decreasing oxygen delivered to the tissues. So if I wanted to have the optimal cancer prevention diet, I'd be eating a lot of potatoes. And I like the white rice too. It's just a little arsenic issue. So I still eat rice about three times a week and I like it, but not like I used to. And, and I got other lectures on you know how I minimize arsenic and rice elsewhere. Okay, somebody also said, well, if I minimize my uh, dietary fat, how can I get my omega-3s? And I'm telling you, there's lots of omega-3s just in regular plant foods. These are some examples. We've talked about this in other lectures on omega-3s, but just so you know, there's plenty of omega-3s. You don't need to eat fish or do anything else. You don't need fish oil. Okay. Okay, and here's just a couple references. Uh, the first one is Otto Warburg, Cell Physiologist, Biochemist Eccentric. It was written by Hans Krebs. So Hans Krebs is the guy who discovered the Krebs cycle. He was a student who worked in the laboratory of Warburg. And um, it's a nice book. It's, I don't know, only about 105 pages of text on Warburg. But you, give a, you get a good summary of the guy. Uh, I thought it was a good book. I, I read through it real fast in like a day. And it, it's good. You don't, you don't need to read that to know Warburg. But if you want to, there it is. Okay, Review of the Medical Literature by Nathan Pritikin. Nathan Pritikin um, was a big admirer of Warburg, and Nathan Pritikin had this whole theory of what he called lipotoxemia, that the dietary fat sticking all the red blood cells together into a rouleau plus the, the thickening of the blood by the chylomicrons causing, and also the triglycerides from eating simple sugars, for example, causing the blood to be thicker, decreasing oxygen flow. Pritikin said, this not only did he believe was the main cause of cancer, he believed that it also was a major cause of almost numerous other problems in the body. Decreased oxygen delivery to the eye, leading to blindness, okay? Decreased oxygen delivery to other areas of the body, impairing the function of those segments, including, of course, you know, the coronary arteries. Um, the Cameron and Goldblatt were two research that had also showed transformation of uh, cells into cancer when they're in hypoxic conditions. Peterson did some research. Uh, especially on hexokinase 2 being a key early uh, change in gene transcription in the initiation of cancer. Um, and so there's additional research on there. There's the book uh, by Travis Christofferson. It's a very good book. Um, actually, I disagree with him on some of his ideas. I'm not going to go into all of that right now, but I do think he's an entertaining writer. It's a clever book, and one can learn a lot from it. Um, I can tell you this. Having studied all this stuff, it leads me to the opinion I want to minimize my dietary fat as much as possible. Um, so a typical 100% plant-based diet, whole food vegan diet, leads you to about 10% or less dietary fat. And I think that's where you want to be, even on the low side of that if you can. Okay, that's it. I hope that was helpful.